Rim je prije 2000 godina bio prvi antički velegrad. U svijetu u kojem je u gradovima rijetko živjelo više od 10.000 stanovnika, Rim ih je imao više od milijun. Tek će gotovo 18 stoljeća poslije neki drugi grad zapadnog svijeta postići taj broj. Without all the technologies our modern cities rely on, technologies of transport, communication, energy. How did they get enough food and drink to the population? How did they house them? How did they maintain law and order? How did they make this great city work? Pokazat ću vam kako je Rim stekao tu premoš nad priješnjim gradovima i prevladao mnoge probleme današnjih velegradova. Vodim vas na putovanje po drevnim neboderima. Nevjerojatno je infrastrukturi. Festiamo proprio sotto il foro. i vrlo ponosnim ljudima. Gradnja antičkog grada, Rim. Funkcioniranje milijunskog grada u antičkim uvjetima bilo je velik izazov. No 31. godine prije nove ere, jedan je čovjek, Octavian, budući car August, postao neprikosnoveni vladar Rima. Njegova je uloga bila održati mir diljem carskog teritorija. No kad ne bi znao upravljati ovom prijestolnicom, ne bi znao upravljati ni carstvom. Kako bi pokazao svoju umješnost, odredio je nova mjerila organizacije grada. So historians are always chucking around numbers for how many inhabitants there were in cities. How do they know? And to be honest, a lot of the time they're bluffing. But with the case of Rome under Augustus, we've got an amazing bit of evidence here. This is Augustus' own account of all his achievements. Augustus was obsessed with numbers. How many victories did he win? How many cities did he found? How many laws did he pass? And he loved counting the citizens. Kensum populi, I did a census of the people. That is, of course, the citizens in all the empire. Luckily, in the case of Rome, he also counted the number of inhabitants of the city. Because they were very privileged citizens, he gave them cash handouts. And he says, on no single occasion did I give the money to less than 250,000 people and on one occasion I gave it to 320,000 people nearly a third of a million people and that is just adult male citizens where are the women where are the children where are the slaves and where are the immigrants it's clear you've got to multiply up a million is the figure people chuck around as the population of Rome To be honest, that's a minimum. In my view, you could be talking about one and a half million people. It is an absolutely enormous number for antiquity. Bilo i drugih velikih prijestolnica prije Rima. Kako je onda ovaj grad postigao što drugi nisu mogli? Možda je najveći očiti suparnik trebala biti Atena. Odista, počesi Rima nastajali su istodobno s njom. Oba su grada prihvatila zajedničku moćnu ideju građanina. SPQR Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and people of Rome. Those were the initials of authority of the citizen body itself. Populus Romanus, the citizens of Rome. In antiquity, that was their symbol of their authority and civic pride. It was picked up in the Renaissance when Rome became an independent city and it has continued to this day. 
the symbol of a city run by its citizens for its citizens. No, u starom Rimu broj stanovnika je rastao i zato se više nije moglo tako upravljati gradom državom. When Rome was founded, 753 BC, and probably for the next 500 years, Rome was a city-state, just like hundreds of city-states in the Greek world, a polis. A polis run by its politai, its citizens. Rome had its kives, it was a kivitas. And just as Greek has given us the word politics and everything related to it, Latin has given us citizen, city, civic, civil, even civilize. So Rome was run by its kives, its citizens, meeting down there in the forum in the central open space. But by 200 BC, Rome was expanding very rapidly and as it acquired an empire, it became harder and harder to run as a city-state. And to cut a complicated story very short, the answer was a new form of military power, the emperor. And the emperors built their palace up there on the Palatine, and from now on, they ran Rome. But they couldn't do without their citizens. They can't ignore their citizens. And one of the major concern of the emperors is to keep the citizen population happy. How can they get them enough food? How can they make sure there's a good water supply? How can they maintain law and order? Mnogo je lakše vidjeti kako je Rim služio svojim građanima nego Atena, jer je sačuvano mnogo više ondašnje infrastrukture. Naime, nema starih karata grčkog glavnog grada, ali zato postoji izniman predmet koji otkriva kako su Rimljani oblikovali grad da bi se prilagodio sve većem broju stanovnika. Today this great wall is the outside wall of a church, the church of St. Cosmas and Damien. In antiquity it was the inside wall of a vast imperial building. And on it there was a fantastic thing, a map of the city of Rome. It was on marble slabs. You can still see the fixing holes for those slabs. And the map spread over the whole wall. On it was depicted the city of Rome in great detail. Alas, those slabs are terribly damaged and broken today. We've only got about a tenth of them. But it's enough to be able to reconstruct in a lot of detail the street plan of ancient Rome. One of the fascinating things we can see from that is that the street plan of the city of Rome in many points corresponded precisely to the street plan that survives today. The modern Via Cavour is six or seven meters above the older street level. And here we're in the Subura, famed in ancient Rome as being the slum district. But though it was a slum district, here we have the Via Urbana, and it follows exactly the course of the ancient Roman Vicus Patricius, which was in fact one of the most snobbish streets in town. Sačuvani fragmenti otkriveni su već 1562. godine. Ali znanstvenici još i danas, četiri stoljeća poslje, nastoje otkriti kamo spada koji dijelić te goleme slaganice. What enables us to place the fragments of the marble plan in this area of town is this road, the Via delle Zoccolette. Its long curve is created by the curve of the Tiber River, just beyond us. And on the fragments we find a street with a long curve, and it fits. To nam otkriva područje dugo gotovo pet i široko tri kilometra, a uključuje mnoge i danas poznate znamenitosti.
Premda vlasti danas mnogopomnije mapiraju i naziru ulice, ipak je teško postići to da gusto naseljeni gradovi funkcioniraju uza sve probleme kao što je strašan promet. Na jednom mjestu trebalo je barem 2000 godine da se postigne ondašnji nivo, kako objašnjava gradonačelnik Rima, koji je upravo zonu oko Koloseja proglasio pješačkom. It was black for the pollution uh, that we had uh, and, uh, and uh, you know it cost about 25 million euros to clean it up and now you can see the stones uh, as they were 2000 years ago. For us one of the interesting things is that already the ancient Romans had the same problems. Julius Caesar closed the forum to traffic, didn't he? Exactly. Do, and, uh, do you, you think of yourself as the new Julius Caesar? No, no, no. <laughs> Stari Rim, baš kao i suvremeni, bio je gusto naseljen. To se odražavalo ne samo u prometu, nego i na svim područjima života. Tu je bio forum. Tu su bile pjace s dučanima. I naravno, stanovi. Kako bi mi pomogla otkriti nepoznanice o tome kako su i gdje stanovali stari Rimljani, pridružila mi se kolegica s Cambridgea Tiziana D'Angelo. So I guess we have Mussolini to thank for clearing the space. Budući da nije imalo vlakove i autobuse, rimsko je stanovništvo moralo živjeti u gradu. Da bi riješili stanovanje za milijuni više ljudi, Rimljani su gradili Uvis. Ovo je nekadašnji stambeni blok ili The Insula. I think it's amazing because below the modern ground level we've got two entire floors. And don't forget the three floors up there. Yeah. So. Five floors in all of ancient Roman apartment blocks. Two thousand years old. It shows how you can do dense housing in the heart of a city, doesn't it? Možemo računati da je u ovom stambenom bloku stanovalo i do 200 ljudi, a to je tek jedan od tisuća kompleksa u kojima je živjelo sve veće rimsko stanovništvo. What I love is that this isn't just a bit of archaeology. It's a bit of living history. There have been people living here right up till 1932. Insule se često prikazuju kao mračni, jadni, natrpani slamovi. No, je li to istina? So this looks like one unit of an apartment. Yeah. Well, there are quite a few of them. There's actually about four. Okay, we've got four. Yes. Uh, and we've got them on five floors. So this is just one standard unit. Mm -hmm. It's not bad in terms of size, is it? Uh, It's not small. No, It's quite no. spacious. We've got, what is it, four meters by nine, 36 square meters. It's much bigger than the average apartment nowadays. People have this image of how Romans lived in apartment buildings in complete squalor, in tiny little pokey apartments. You've got filth on the floors, you've got bare walls. Is this life in a Roman apartment? Well, you have to use a little bit of imagination. There is no reason why these walls or this ceiling could not be decorated when they were built. So, for example, look at the ceiling. We do have traces of plaster. So probably the whole ceiling and all the walls were plastered. Yeah. But we could do something more for you if you're difficult. You. So we could decorate <laughs> I, I'm a, a demanding bit. client here. <laughs> we could decorate a bit further. For example, that back wall, that main wall, um, second century, we could paint it, those red and yellow panels yep. that were so stylish. No, What are you going to do with the floors? Well, we'll clean it up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and then we could have something like what we have in the corridor outside, yeah. that opus picatum, so the herringbone yeah. pattern, yeah. which is very resistant on the one hand, and it looks relatively pretty. That's okay, suppose I'm, I'm the tenant, I'm moving in, and I say, excuse me, landlord, I really don't like this floor at all. I want a proper mosaic floor. Nedaleko odavde su i ostaci ukrasa. Ovo izgleda kao suvremena zgrada. This is a kid's library. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Oh my god. Okay, so what is going on here? 
I think we've got some serious Roman bricks. Yeah, it's much more regular. Kuće su se u Rimu, kao i u svakome gradu, stalno mijenjale, dobivale nove vlasnike koji su ih preuređivali. Look at this mosaics. Yes, it's some sort of psychedelic, isn't it? It's, oh, oh, it's as if someone's been trying to balance ostrich eggs on top of each other and they're all taking a tumble. <laughs> well, in the What's second that? century AD, this would have been quite fashionable, actually. Um, it's a black and white mosaic, and yes, you're right, the pattern is not a masterpiece, and you can also see that from the size of the tessere. They're quite big, it's over mm. one centimeter. But still, the mosaicists were taking a long time to make these works, and they were paid quite well. They were paid 60-65 denarii per day. That's quite a bit. That's an enormous amount. That's way over a legionary's pay. Well, it's an excellent floor, though. Great work if you can get it. <laughs> and you need more than a mosaicist statue. You need a plumber. Yes, that's I do important. want running water in my apartment, please. <laughs> and lo and behold. Yes. We have a pipe running through. So presumably this means that at least in some rooms there is piped water. Čudesno je zapravo da je u prvom stoljeću nove ere bilo pojedinačnih stanova u rimskim stambenim blokovima koji su imali izravnu opskrbu tekućom vodom. To je nešto što u mnogim dijelovima svijeta nemaju ni danas. There's nothing so important for the health of a great city as clean water. Clean water to drink, clean water to wash in. One of the joys of Rome is that there are fountains with lovely fresh water everywhere. And that's down to the Renaissance popes who filled Rome with fountains like this one outside the Palazzo Farnese. Oddly enough, this particular fountain is made from apart from a, a Roman bath. The baths of Caracalla, this ornamental bath, was brought in to make a fountain. Because the Romans too, the ancient Romans, really understood the importance of fresh water. And they brought it in in vast quantities. We all know that the Romans had big baths, but don't forget, the fundamental thing was they had a fresh supply of drinking water. To nije bio mali pothod. Bio je to možda najveći projekt gradnje javne infrastrukture ikada poduzet u antičkom svijetu. Aqueducts are one of the most vivid signs of the growth of the population of Rome. The first ones built as early as 312 BC and one after another are added until in the end there are 11 separate aqueducts providing water. They got their water from the south of the city on the whole. The Alban hills immediately to the south were volcanic and that's not such good water. So they went further south to the limestone hills of the Apennines and that meant pushing their technology, building enormously long aqueducts. This particular aqueduct, built by the Emperor Claudius, went 45 miles back. And it's an extraordinary feat of engineering to bring water 45 miles without the use of pumps. It means you have to keep it gently, gently, gently sloping down. That means building great arches across the valleys. Sometimes you build tunnels under mountains. It's not just an extraordinary engineering feat, it's also an extraordinary feat of organization. We happen to have a treatise by a chap called Frontinus. He was a Roman general. Indeed, he was the Roman general who conquered Wales. And when he'd finished beating up a few barbarians, he came back to Rome and organized the aqueducts. And he wrote down, being an extraordinarily efficient man, in absolute detail, about each aqueduct, exactly how long it is, how many liters of water it carried, how many men it had in their maintenance teams, and so on and so on. And you can see the enormous administrative machine that lies behind keeping the people of Rome supplied with fresh water. Pape u doba renesanse nastojali su ih ponovno izgraditi, ali čak ni tih tisuću godina poslije nisu bili ravni svojim antičkim prethodnicima. So the aqua marcia is 
a fantastic bit of Roman construction running at quite a high level. And here we have the Aqua Felice, a sort of concrete tube was the best that the popes could manage. Here we have its name, Aqua Felice. They're really rather proud of it. They put a little plaque in marble. But let's not pretend it's at the same level of engineering expertise as the Roman aqueducts of antiquity. Što više, samo je uživljavanje starorimskog sustava akvedukta omogućilo gradnju onih spektakularnih fontana renesansnog Rima. The Campo dei Fiori here. In the morning it's a flower and vegetable market, in the evening it's where everyone comes for a drink. In antiquity it's where the great theatre of Pompey was, and you can see it very clearly on the marble plan of Rome. There's one more thing that really interests me about this place, and it's the best salami shop in Rome, and in fact I'm going there right now. It was of enormous importance to emperors to keep the citizens fed. A quarter of a million citizens got free grain under Augustus. But gradually, emperors added other offers. They got free oil. In 270, the emperor Aurelian, he's the guy who built the great walls around Rome, he added a pork ration. Five pounds of pork a head per month they got. In total, three million pounds of pork per annum were consumed at the emperor's expense. And Rome, ancient Rome, was full of pork butchers, suarii. And that tradition has lingered on. Stari Rimljani obožavali su kobasice, kao i ja. Kad sam živio u Rimu, često sam dolazio ovamo, a Benedetto je uvijek spreman za šalu. Allora, ecco le per te, cinque libri di carne. Ah, benissimo, accetto, accetto. E la porzione per un mese. Questa qui è la porzione per una settimana per te. Per me sì. Siamo un po' cresciuti nel Come frattempo. Come va? Tutto bene, sì. sì. Beh, è stato un piacere. Alla prossima allora. Un piacere enorme. <ride> Questa è la mia razione da cittadino romano. Ciao Andrea. Ciao. Samo pet minuta hoda odande, označeni na mramornoj karti, nalazili su se riječni dokovi drevnog grada. To je bila četvrt skladišta dučana i privatnih stanova, baš kao i danas. Često su moderne kuće i lokali, kao i ove restoran, izgrađeni na starima. Buonasera, benvenuto allo oh, Stella Romana. Roberto. Oh, Roberto! Welcome! Che piacere! Welcome. Che cosa I mi hai portato? A little prosecco. Oh, a little okay. prosecco. Fantastic! <laughs> Gli antichi romani, su questa strada, se non mi sbaglio, ci sono tantissime tracce sì, di loro. Sì, sì, questa è la verità. Anche, anche qui? Anche sono... qua sotto abbiamo molte cose belle. Oh, sì, sì, nella cantina. Avete? 
Eh, sono delle cose simpaticissime che le deve vedere che sono delle cose molto belle. Uh, I, I suspected as much uh, because every place I've ever been into here has got yet another bit of ancient room. Dove andiamo? Andiamo qui fa... sotto, ma anti... c'è un po' di disordine qua. <laughs> Ovo è un ristorante izgrađen 6 metri iznad stare razine zemlje. Tko zna kakva se blaga scrivaju ispod? This is what I was hoping for, a little door down to the cellar. <laughs> Vedi, questo è un vecchio pavimento. What do we have? What do we have? Non c'è dappertutto. Eh? Si respira la muffa. <laughs> you can smell the antiquity. <laughs> But this is amazing. Oh my God. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a wee beastie down there. I think it's a horse. No? No? Is it a horse? It's a hippocamp. And there's, there's someone, that's a nymph riding a seahorse. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. That is a better piece of mosaic than in the official excavations just behind. This is the first level, because there are other three levels below that. And this is the fourth. Fantastic. Mm. He's saying that's not all there is, because there are three further levels down below it. And that's, that's Rome. That's the heart of Rome. Dig down and you will find antiquity. And you find it at many levels. Rimsko stanovništvo bilo je tako brojno da ne 2000 godina povijesti nije mogla sve zatrpati ispod zemlje. Well, here I am standing on top of a ginormous Roman rubbish heap, an ancient Roman rubbish heap. This is 50 meters and more above the modern street level. That means, as we look around, there's not a single rooftop that even comes up near the height of this. And it's enormous. Going around it, it's more than a kilometer in circumference. That means it's the equivalent of something like six urban blocks. And it's not any old rubbish. This is quite specialized rubbish. Have a look, let's have a look at it. It is entirely composed of these things, terracotta fragments from pots called amphorae. Procenjuje se da se brijeg sastoji od 50 milijuna amfora. So we know an enormous amount about Roman amphorae. They're terribly distinctive. And they all come in different shapes and sizes from all the corners of the Mediterranean. And the archaeologists who've studied these, and what you need to do, uh, that's a bit of the bottom, but it's much better to get one of these. Now that is a rim, and that gives you the dimensions of the amphora. Um, or you look for a handle. There's a nice handle. And you can pin them down, and the archaeologists say that these are all from Spain, from South Spain, from Bitica, and they all contained olive oil. And what do they need this prodigious amount of olive oil for? After all, there's a limit to how many salads you can eat. But it's not just for cooking. It's also for illumination. They don't have any electricity. They have little lamps which they fill up with olive oil. And it's also for washing, there's no soap. So for cleaning, you cover your body with olive oil and scrape it down. So they get through enormous quantities of this olive oil. So our, our rubbish heap is on a great bend in the Tiber River. You can just about make it out down there, that line of trees, and it goes right round us and round there. And this whole area down below us was full of warehouses. And round the corner, this particular stuff, these olive oil amphorae, probably came from the Horia Galbana, Galba's warehouses, which is actually marked on the map of Rome. Tiber teče kroz srce suvremenog Rima baš kao i u stara vremena. Ali velika je razlika između rijeke onda i danas. Today, the Tiber is flanked on both sides by massive embankments. These were built in the late 19th century to stop the city from flooding. In antiquity, there were no embankments and they had terrible problems with flooding, but they used the river. 
In antiquity, the river was buzzing with activity. There were boats coming up and down. You don't see a single boat on the Tiber today. There were hundreds of boats bringing up merchandise, grain, wine, oil, and luxury goods, of course, to the hundreds of warehouses that lined the banks of the river. No da bi Rim mogao funkcionirati za milijun ljudi, Tiber je mogao biti samo dio mnogo većeg transportnog sustava. Rim je širio svoje trgovačke veze kako bi opskrbljivao sve veće stanovništvo, pa su se osnivala središta koja će upravljati golemim količinama uvozne robe namijenjene prijestolnici. One of the places you get the most vivid idea of the sheer scale and complexity of the trade that supplies Rome with food is here in Ostia. We, what we have is an enormous piazza with a sort of covered walkway here and behind it a series of offices. And this is where the shippers and traders do their business. Uh, and they put up sort of publicity signs. This is a picture of the River Nile and its delta, Egypt. And Alexandria were one of the most important sources of trade in the empire. Here we have a rather nice picture of how you do the shipping. You come into harbour with a big ship and there's a guy on the gangplank bringing over an amphora which is moving on to a smaller ship which is then going to go upriver to the warehouses uh, in Rome. Then over here we've got a rather nice scene of the lighthouse. Of course, when you're coming across the Mediterranean and you see the great lighthouse, you know you've made it at last. And there are a couple of ships, dolphins and so on. And here we can see just where they come from. Here we have the Naviculari, the shippers, and the Negotiantes, the businessmen of Caralis, that's Cagliari in Sardinia. And Remember, it's not just one trade. Some people own the ships, some people do the negotiation, do the business, because there is a lot of money both to make and to lose in shipping. And you can just imagine, uh, this place would be full of hundreds of traders trying to do a little deal. One of the interesting things is they're all private. They're doing it for the state. They're doing it because Rome needs corn. But individuals can make a packet out of it. Here are the people, isn't this wonderful? This elephant uh, saying you are in North Africa and they are from Sabratha in Libya. That whole coast of North Africa supplying Rome with corn but also with other goods. And this is, is, is the place where trade happens. This is the place you come and make a fortune. Ostija je bila tako unosno trgovačko središte da se razvijala i kao grad za sebe. Još se i danas vide tragovi bogatstva na zgradama i ukrasima. U prvom stoljeću u Rim je pristizalo toliko bogatstva i svjetske trgovine da Ostija više nije mogla držati korek. Stari Rim morao se prilagoditi i širiti se još dalje. Tri kilometra sjeverno od Ostije započeo je gradnju monumentalne infrastrukture koja će održavati to bujanje grada. Bilo je to na mjestu najvećeg transportnog središta suvremene Italije. Well, here we are, right by the hurly-burly of Rome's Fiumicino airport, traffic whizzing past all the time, low-flying planes whizzing overhead, sometimes hard to make yourself heard. And yet, this is one of the least well-known but most important of Roman sites. It's the great port of Rome that the Romans simply called Portus, the port. Now, Rome didn't have a natural harbour. The Tiber comes out into the sea and it doesn't have a bay around it. Think of Athens. They had the Piraeus, a natural harbour. Rome had to make a harbour artificially, overcoming natural obstacles. And that took the resources of empire. It took the Emperor Claudius and these 
columns are very typical of constructions by the Emperor Claudius, who cared about infrastructure. He cared about chunky, practical building. And he made a vast artificial harbour at the mouth of the Tiber. Zajedno s Lukom nastale su okolne zgrade i skladišta. Kako bih pojmio o kakvim je razmjerima tu riječ, nalazim se sa svojim starim prijateljem, Simonom Kejem, koji je otkrio nešto čudesno. Well, my Simon, you, you've been busy bees. We certainly have, we certainly quite have. A, quite a hole you've made in this poor beauty spot. Simon je iskopao tek sičušni dijelić cijele lučke infrastrukture. Ovaj rov samo je dio jednog veza unutar masivnog kompleksa. This bay would originally have been just under 60 meters long. So, that's actually three of these. You have to imagine them stacked against one another. Way, way down there. And it's just under 12 meters wide. Height? Height, well, are you prepared for it? <laughs> this is a building which stands to at least, well, a maximum of 18 meters, which is somewhere up there. At the top of the trees? Okay. So this is yeah. truly massive. Mm -mm. And it's meant to be seen. It's a statement about what the Romans are able to do in creating a, a facade that reflects Roman power and has a great functional use yeah. and so on. Vidimo tek trećinu jednog veza. Zamislite, ta 18 metara visoka konstrukcija bila bi tek dijelić kompleksa u kojem se moglo smjestiti barem 500 brodova. I stoga samo naslučujemo razmjere te luke. Njezino područje obuhvaća zapanjujućih 350 hektara, a dio toga je danas spalača Vojvode s force Cezarinija, koji osjeća snažnu vezu sa svojom rimskom prošlošću. Posso chiedere quanto è importante per lei personalmente conservare l'antichità romana? Beh, molto. Il senso storico e l'abitudine a convivere con le cose del passato è uno c'è nato dentro e quindi mi sento assolutamente di dovere per quel che posso tutelare, preservare e valorizzare, mantenere. Eh sì, penso di sì, sì, ce l'ho. È molto forte, è molto forte in me. Claudio è sgradio Porto Serie Ostia postala premala za Rim. No trgovina se tako brzo razvijela da je Trajan u drugom stoljeću morao opet proširiti luku. Izgrađen je novi bazen od 30 hektara. Zabilježeno je da je oblikovan kao golemi šestorokut, kako bi se maksimalno iskoristio prostor za vezanje brodova. To se slabo vidi ovako na tlu. Samo je jedan način da to dobro izvidimo. S visine od 500 metara jasno se vide stranice Trajanova šestorokuta. Luckily enough, the Emperor Claudius left his mark in the shape of this inscription here, which explains a bit about what he thought he was doing in making his great port. Like all imperial inscriptions, it starts with his name in enormous letters. Tiberius, Claudius, son of Drusus, Caesar, and then a whole load of titles that go on for a couple of lines. And then he explains what he's up to. Fossis ductis. I dug canals from the Tiber in order to support my works on the port. And by doing so, he says, letting them out into the sea, I saved the city of Rome from the danger of flooding. So he sees his engineering works as a whole package. It's not just that he creates a port, he links the port to the city by the canals, and the canals save the city from the danger of flooding. Ovo je jedan od njih. Zovu ga Fiumicino, Riječica, a svoje je ime podario i obližnjem rimskom aerodromu. Premda iz doba Klaudija i dalje je posve funkcionalan. Zdravljamo. 
Čak i 400 godina prije dovršenja ovih kanala, Rimljani su shvaćali važnost odvodnje u svome gradu. One of the vital steps of turning Rome into a city from just a cluster of villages was to create a great drain, the Cloaca Maxima. The original settlements were on hilltops, the Palatine Hill, the Capitoline Hill, and between them was an enormous swamp, a river flowing down and spreading out. To get from one hilltop to another, you had to use a boat. And it's one of the first kings of Rome, you could call him a tyrant, Tarquin, who famously created the Cloaca Maxima, the great drain of Rome. And what that great drain does is get rid of the swamp and create a dry area which was to become the forum, the heart of the city. But the Cloaca Maxima served other purposes too, and progressively all sorts of stuff was sent down into the great drain and it turned into a great sewer. So, what's all this? Okay. Crikey. <laughs> right. Is there another arm? There's another arm. Oh, it's rather small. Right. That'll keep the shit out. Kloaka vodi kilometar i pol sa sjevera na jug, da ispod zemlje prolazi starim i suvremenim Rimom. Grčki pisac Strabon rekao je da je kanal dovoljno širok za kola na tovare na slamu. Ne mogu mu proturječiti, ovo je golemo. Nalazim se sa šefom ekipe arheologa koji proučavaju kloaku, doktorom Lukom Antonioljem. Ah, l'imperatore Domiziano. L'imperatore Domiziano. E siamo proprio sotto il foro. Qui siamo sotto il foro di Nervo. Tutta questa costruzione che, che non è in laterizio. Ha ah, insieme una parte in tufo, una sì. parte in laterizio, in bipedale, sì. e tutta la volta fatta in cementizio, in opera cementizio. And you can see the wooden shattering on which it was poured. What I love about uh, Roman cement is this was poured in AD 100 or so and it's still a solid and serviceable. It works for the sewers of Rome today. It doesn't need any form of repair. Čudesno je, ali kloaka Maxima preživjela je propast Rima. Tijekom vremena, dok je važnost grada bljedila, a gore na forumu se izgradile kuće kasnije grima, kloaku su zaboravili. E la kloaka viene sepolta, cioè viene tutta riempita di materiale fino alla volta, tanto che nel 1500 sopra qua viene fatta un'altra fogna che ha lo stesso percorso della kloaka, senza sapere che sotto ce n'era un'altra. They build new drains because they don't even realize this drain is running underneath. And it's not until the 19th century, when Rome becomes the capital city, that they rediscover and reactivate the great sewers of ancient Rome. Rimska kanalizacija, kao i njegovi akvedukti, bila je pokušaj da se održi javno zdravlje grada koji je premašio milijun stanovnika. No, nije samo svakodnevni život bio izazov. Tu su bili i smrt, te problemi ukopa. Ovo možda izgleda kao šupa u parku, ali u njoj se skriva nešto drugo. Od drugog stoljeća nove ere nadalje, kod sprovoda je sve popularnije bilo kremiranje. Nije čudo, jer je broj stanovnika rastao, a prostor je bio dragocijan. I have to say, this is one of my favorite Roman tombs. It, it's called the Columbarium of Pomponius Hillas. Well, as we discovered as we were coming down the stairs, uh, but Pomponius, was he the owner of this tomb? He wasn't, right? No, he's clearly not. There's that beautiful mosaic beautiful with his classic. name and griffins around a lyre. Oh. It's charming, but it's quite clear. He was one of the last people to be buried in here. The, the first guy's got to be this guy, hasn't it? Or the first couple, because there's the man and his wife. 
and they got a most prominent location as well, probably yeah. not by the stairway, but on the main wall, and they built themselves this really nice and large niche. And, and you, you, you've got him and his wife depicted on the wall. And look at the material, they look like alabaster asherns, which was yeah. very expensive. Yeah, you pay a lot. Yeah, because they probably um, actually paid for this whole thing. They took yeah. care of the entire decoration on this ceiling and here in the abscess, yeah. you can see similar stuff. So I think we have to assume these are people who've, he, he's made a packet and yet he's not one of the Roman nobles, is he? Uh, the, whole, the whole Roman fashion for having grand ostentatious tombs starts with the Roman nobility. But by the time we're here in the first century AD, the sort of people who are being buried are actually ex-slaves. This guy is Granius uh, Nestor. Nestor. Nestor, a sort of Greek mythological name. Uh, uh, a freeborn man could have it but it's very improbable. And his wife's called Haydone, which means <laughs> Haydone, Mrs. Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very characteristic slave name, isn't it? They also present themselves in a very Roman way. Look at yeah. him. They are wearing a toga, holding a scroll. It could be the sort of image that they want to project of themselves, of good Roman citizens. They're really showing that they made it in a way. They yeah. made it in their circle. And look at it. Look at what they got. The use of colour is fantastic. Isn't I mean, it? that was Egyptian blue, one mm. of the most expensive pigments that you could possibly get in antiquity. So that already tells us something. It's not like the other niches. They are just yellow and red, which are natural colors, so way less expensive. You want to project the same values that you have in real life also here. You want to be able to see it in the commemorations that perhaps were held here every year. So that's what you want the living to see and to commemorate you for. Ova grobnica ima više od 100 niša za Pepe opokojnika. Riječ Kolumbari dolazi od latinske riječi za Golubarnik. They come from a city that's densely populated. Yeah. There are tens of thousands of other people like them, and they don't even dream of having a tomb all to themselves. They build it with lots and lots of slots for lots of other people. It's a bit like an insular block, isn't it? You can see so them like stacking, stacking up, up, and they're all packed in like sardines, because in a, in a, in a really crowded city, you live stacked up in apartment blocks and you die stacked up in Columbaria. Every great city depends on immigration. It needs it for numbers, it needs it for cheap labour, it needs it for specialist services. Modern Rome and here we are, near the station, in an area full of immigrants. Bangladeshis, Chinese, Africans, Romanians, all sorts. Modern Rome couldn't function without its immigrants, and it's just the same in ancient Rome. Unlike modern Europe, in ancient Rome, there's no limitation on immigration. And indeed, there is compulsory immigration. Slavery means that tens, even hundreds of thousands of people are brought from all over the world to Rome. And then there are plenty who come voluntarily. Free men, citizens, they come to Rome to make their fortune. Gradio silno privlačio. Za razliku od provincija, u Rimu nije bilo poreza i građani su dobivali poklone u hrani, a kad kad i novcu. Pod carem Augustom, Rim je postao najveći poslodavac antičkog svijeta, s javnim službama koje neće naći premca još idućih 18 stoljeća. To je ni manje ni više uključivalo i profesionalnu vatrogasnu službu od 7000 vatrogasaca. The most important thing that Augustus did to protect Rome from fire was to set up a fire brigade. It was a quasi-military organization with seven cohorts this is an inscription put up by the fifth cohort. In each cohort, there are a thousand men. Those seven cohorts controlled the 14 regions of Rome. So each cohort is split in two and does two regions. Here we have 
an inscription from cohort number five. And these three guys at the top in the biggest letters are the most important. The prefect, Gaius Julius Quintilianus. The sub-prefect, Marcus Firmius Ambintianus. And then there's a tribune. And then these guys are the centurions. And one of the intriguing things about them is each of them gives where they came from. Now, you'd expect the fire brigade of Rome to be locally recruited, but no. This guy comes from a place called Berva, which is near Venice. This guy comes from Severia, which is in Hungary. This one from Ratiaria, which is in Bulgaria. This one from Poitovio in Slovenia, and this one from Aquincum, which is Budapest in Hungary. So they come from <laughs> way, way east of Rome. That's not all. You then flip round the other side, and then you get all the names of the ordinary vigores, all thousand of them, in teeny little letters, column after column. Pod carem Neronom 64. godine nove ere, vigile su stavljeni na kušnju kad je velika vatra harala Rimom. Bila je to katastrofa. Poznato je kako su cara optužili da je svirao dok je Rim gorio. Možemo raspravljati o tome što je uzrokovalo požar, ali pouznano znamo kako je Neron poslije reagirao. We're underneath the street level of modern Rome and under a multiplex cinema. When they were constructing this, they were trying to go further down to add extra rooms. And what they found was they were blocked by a massive bit of Roman building. What we have here is two entire urban blocks back to back with each other. There were at least three floors in this insula. We know from the brick stamps Romans like to stamp their bricks with their names. We know from those that it was built under the Emperor Nero. What we can see here are the dividing walls of the two blocks. And Nero said, you're not allowed to use party walls. You can't build one block against another. You've got to have separate walls because that stops the fire spreading. Tijekom velikog požara, vigile su se tužili na manjak vode za gašenje plamena. Neron je odredio da svaka insula mora imati pristup dovoljno velikoj cisterni. Unatoč tim reformama, priča o Neronu pripovjeda se i danas. Suvremena vatrogasna služba preuzela ime Vigiles i slavi svoje antičke parnjake. Well, here is a, a fine-looking group of vigiles, the standard bearer, and a, a, a pretty tough lot they look. I don't think I would want to mess with them. Um, and we have here the centurion, Simone. Ah, <laughs> Grandi ah, piacere. Complimenti. Grazie. Mi puoi fare capire qual era l'attrezzatura che serviva per loro? Beh, l'attrezzatura dei vigili Diciamo che da allora adesso non è cambiata molto, avevano degli attrezzi che eh, servivano soprattutto per la demolizione degli, di, degli edifici. Nel caso che eh, il rischio che il fuoco si, si estenda. Certo, certo. Uh -huh. Allora, eh, venivano per demolire utilizzavano questi martelli uh -huh. oppure l'ascia romana, che è questa. Uh -huh. Ah, a Roman axe. Sì. Wow, wow, this is one scary bit of kit. This would be through the woodwork in no time. E per spegnere il fuoco come lo fate? Eh, utilizzavano queste. Questi sono i centones. Aha. Sono eh, pezzi di stoffa fatti con eh, il residuato della lavorazione della lana. Mm -hmm. Senti com'è dura. Mm. Fabulous. A Roman fire blanket, which you, you make of a patchwork of, 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 of wool. E... Li bagnavano no. dentro le botti mm -hmm. in acqua e aceto e andavano a spegnere le fiamme. Mm. So this, this you, you dip in water, but also vinegar, because vinegar has an important fire retardant 
effect. Vodu su iz cisterna nosili u amforama. Bravissimo. Yes, I can imagine it might be a bit hard to extinguish a fire just chucking it straight from the amphora. No, vigiles su imali tajno oružje, stapnu srpku zvanu sifon. Questa funziona in questo modo, a due pistoni. Allora, veniva inserita l'acqua e pressurizzata l'aria. Ecco che l'acqua andava in pressione. So you have two tubes, one sucks the water in, then it passes into the piston, and as the water goes in, the air is under pressure, and then as you send the valves up and down, the water squirts out. Both sides. Mm, bravissimo. Grazie. Allora, il vostro gruppo c'ha un motto? Certo, è il motto dei vigili da 2000 anni. Ah. Vigiles! Ubi dolor! Vigiles! Fantastico. <laughs> Neronovi Vigiles bili su poluvojna organizacija, te su imali i policijske dužnosti. Zajedno s drugim paravojnim snagama, bilo je čak 20.000 ljudi kojima je zadaća bila štititi građane Rima. Načela policijskog posla ostala su ista i u suvremenom Rimu, premda se tehnologija promijenila. Nazorne kamere obavljaju veći dio posla koji je bio dužnost Vigilesa. No, premda Rimljani nisu imali digitalno mapiranje, svačali su da je imati plan ključno za funkcioniranje grada, baš kao i mnogih drugih područja rimskog života. Jedina privatna kuća označena na karti grada, rezidencija je gradskog prefekta, Lucija Fabija Cilona, čovjeka odgovornog za javni mir i poreda Krima. Čini se posve mogućim da je forma urbis, dokument koji nam je omogućio uvid u plan starog Rima, zapravo bila izložena u uredu šefa policije. Already under Augustus, the population of Rome had reached a million and it probably stayed at more or less the same level for the next three, even four hundred years. It's not until the imperial power of Rome implodes that the population also collapses. By the middle of the 6th century, it may have shrunk to as few as 30,000 people. And no city in Europe was again to reach the figure of a million until the beginning of the 19th century. That's it. It's not that London was a place of the world's world's world. It was clear to me where it goes from. It was clear to me. Ali ipak, Rim je postigao milijun u doba kada je svjetsko stanovništvo bilo tek dijelić današnjeg. I to bez motornog prijevoza, plina ili struje. Danas živimo u svijetu velegradova, ali Rim je i dalje nadahnuće svima njima. Hvala.